There is one basic question that motivates science, religion, and philosophy. Where do we come from? There are many levels to this question. What created the universe? What created us? How have we come to be? Why do we exist? Historical geology can't help us answer some of these more existential questions, but it can shed light on the origin of our planet and all of the changes that have occurred on it over time. There are a number of hypotheses for the origin of the solar system. The leading theory is called the nebular hypothesis. This theory states that the sun, the planets, and all the other objects in the solar system formed billions of years ago from a rotating cloud of gas and dust. Most, if not all, star systems in our universe may be created through this process. A nebula is a cloud of gas and dust. The solar nebula that birthed our solar system must have consisted primarily of hydrogen, helium, and rocky dust-like particles. Under the influence of gravity, the hydrogen and helium would have condensed, compressed, and coalesced, becoming our sun. Our sun primarily consists of hydrogen and helium, and its heat and light are created by a type of nuclear reaction. Nuclear fusion of hydrogen atoms produce helium and energy, which the sun emits as electromagnetic radiation, solar light and heat. As the rotating gases of the solar nebula collapsed inward and hydrogen fusion began to take place within the sun, the dust and gases of the nebula would have been forced to spread outward near its equator, forming a disk, a consequence of the physics of a rotating system. In the dense disk rotating around the protostar, Dust particles had a tendency to collide and stick to each other, leading to the formation of larger particles. We call this process accretion. As the particles continued to collide and coalesce during accretion, they grew larger and larger. And in the process, the collisions became less frequent, but more intense. The density of the disk and the cloud as a whole decreased over time. And ultimately, accretion produced the planets, moons, asteroids, and meteoroids of our solar system. Radiometric dating of meteorites shows that most space rocks in our solar system are between 4.53 and 4.58 billion years old indicating that our solar system and probably our own planet are at least that old as well. Of course, the formation of our solar system did not end with accretion. The first 500 million years or so were a tumultuous time. It's conceivable that the solar system didn't start with eight planets like it does today. Instead, it may have contained dozens or more small ones called planetesimals. These small planetary bodies would have struggled to clear and secure their orbits around the sun. Their orbits would have frequently passed and intersected with each other. Debris would have filled their way. Under these circumstances, Collisions were likely common. Planets and moons were probably made and unmade, formed and reformed on a somewhat regular basis. Analyses of rock samples collected by astronauts during moon missions have provided clues to the formation of our planet and nearest neighbor, 
Luna. According to radiometric dates, the oldest lunar rocks are between 4.4 and 4.5 billion years old, suggesting that the moon is about that old. It's safe to assume that the Earth and moon probably formed around the same time, in one respect or another. If so, its rocks give us more clues as to the age of our planet. There are three leading hypotheses for how the Earth got its moon. The accretion hypothesis suggests that the Earth and moon formed together, much like the solar system and the planets did. In this scenario, the Earth and moon would have started as a single nebular cloud. As the Earth formed at the center of this cloud, the moon would have formed from a disk that developed along its equator. However, there is little evidence to support this hypothesis. The hypothesis suggests that the Earth and Moon should have roughly the same composition because they formed from the same cloud. In fact, the Moon contains far fewer metals than the Earth, suggesting that it or its material came from elsewhere. With this in mind, another hypothesis has been proposed. This hypothesis suggests that the moon and earth form separately in different parts of the solar system. When they crossed paths, the earth captured the moon with its gravitational pull, forcing it into the moon's current orbit. Scientists are generally skeptical about this hypothesis because there is some doubt that the Earth would have had the energy necessary to prevent the moon from escaping its new orbit. The physics don't add up. The leading theory is called the Great Impact Hypothesis. According to this theory, the moon formed from debris that was ejected from the collision of Earth and a Mars-sized planetesimal called Theia around 4.5 billion years ago. The two planets would have merged into one with the mixing of their material. But given the scale of the collision, much of the planetesimal Theia would have likely been ejected into space as debris, where it would have began to orbit around the Earth and coalesce into the moon over time. This hypothesis is generally favored over the others because it is consistent with our understanding of the formation of the solar system. There were many collisions at that time. In addition, it can explain why the Earth's spin and the moon's orbit have similar orientations and why they differ so much in composition. The moon consists of Theia, not Earth. The issue has not been settled. There is still a very real and very active debate about the origin of the moon. But the giant impact hypothesis currently has the most support of all the possibilities. Any way you slice it, space rock collisions were a natural and significant part of early Earth history. Earth began as a hot, molten mass of material. As it cooled, heavy elements like iron and nickel sank under the influence of gravity to the center of the planet, where they now make up the Earth's core. Lighter materials like silicon and oxygen were displaced to the surface of the planet, where they now occur in the quartz and feldspar minerals of the crust. As the planet cooled, it differentiated into lighter granitic or silicon rich and heavier basaltic or iron rich components. And the layers of the planet, the core, mantle, and crust started to come into existence. These processes help to explain the distribution of elements, rocks, and minerals on our world today. It is why our crust contains high concentrations of feldspar and quartz. 
We refer to the first part of Earth history as the Precambrian. The Precambrian includes all of the time in Earth history that passed prior to the origin of animals around 540 million years ago during the Cambrian period. The Precambrian spanned from 4.6 billion years ago to 540 million years ago. In total, it represents nearly 90% of Earth history. Animals were very late to the party. The Precambrian is divided into three eons, the Hadean, the Archean, and the Proterozoic. The oldest of these eons is the Hadean, which lasted from 4.6 to 4 billion years ago. Historically, it refers to the time before Earth had a stable surface, the time interval for which we have no rocks on Earth. Recent advances have changed our understanding a bit. Scientists, in fact, have found a number of rocks from this eon, like the Acosta Nice, located in the Northwest Territories of Canada, 300 kilometers north of Yellowknife. It is a metamorphic rock that was produced from metamorphism of an older igneous intrusive rock that formed at the end of the Hadean. This eon takes its name from Hades, the Greek god of the underworld. It is thought that the earth during this time had a hellish landscape as it had only recently formed and was still cooling. Although the sun was much dimmer, earth likely contained many short lived radioactive elements, which would have been releasing heat as they decayed. Not to mention, the planet was under heavy bombardment caused by collisions with asteroids and planetesimals. It was during the Hadean Eon that a great impact likely produced the moon, Luna. Despite these conditions, the oceans and atmosphere of our planet probably first formed during the Hadean Eon. Of course, they would have been dramatically different than they are now. The sun was likely much dimmer. The atmosphere likely contained extremely high concentrations of carbon dioxide, water, and hydrogen gas, and very little oxygen or nitrogen like you find today. In this atmosphere, the pressure would have been 27 times greater than its present levels on the surface. You find this pressure on Earth today, but only hundreds of feet below the ocean surface. There was probably a positive side to this extreme atmospheric pressure. It may have allowed for the existence of liquid water on the surface, possibly even an ocean. Again, it would have greatly differed from the ocean today. There wouldn't have been life of any kind. The water would have contained no oxygen, and lots of metals, and you definitely wouldn't want to swim in it. One of the most significant events in the Hadean Eon may have been the late heavy bombardment. Scientists speculate there was an interval between 4.1 and 3.8 billion years ago when the Earth and other rocky planets of the solar system were impacted by a disproportionately high number of asteroids. This theory originates with studies of rocks and craters on the moon done following the Apollo moon landings. The studies suggest that most lunar impact structures formed during a specific window of time, the late heavy bombardment. If this theory is correct, the bombardment may have been caused by the migration of the giant planets to the outer parts of the solar system. As Jupiter, Saturn, and the others passed through the asteroid belt, they may have scattered asteroids, setting them on a collision course with the rocky inner planets like Earth. 
The end of bombardment and the cooling of the surface ushered in major changes during the Archean Eon. The Archean lasted from roughly 4 to 2.5 billion years ago. Unlike the Hadean, the Archean is known from many, if not a lot, of rocks. These rocks have often been heavily cooked. Many of them are metamorphosed deep water rocks like banded iron formations. Many Archean rock formations are referred to as greenstone belts, which are zones of metamorphosed mafic to ultramafic volcanic rocks mixed with clastic sedimentary strata and chert. They usually occur between granite and gneiss bodies. Greenstone belts get their name from their color, which is caused by the presence of minerals like chlorite, actinolite, and amphiboles. Many of them were produced by rift volcanism followed by metamorphism. Of course, the landscape was still very different than it is today. The temperature in the Archean would have been comparable to now, but the sun was likely much dimmer, perhaps only 75% of its modern luminosity level. The earth was likely kept warm by the greenhouse effect. The atmosphere likely contained high concentrations of carbon dioxide and possibly methane. It would have almost or entirely lacked oxygen, so you wouldn't have been able to survive in those times. There was an ocean in the Archean, but again, it was very different than it is today. For most of the Archean, it may have been a global ocean, but there was no life and no oxygen, at least not in the beginning. The ocean was probably green or red in color because it contained high concentrations of iron and iron bearing minerals. And due to high concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which would have dissolved into the ocean, seawater would have been highly acidic so there would have been very little deposition of carbonate rocks. Despite these circumstances, there were big things on the horizon. Some of the most important things in Earth history happened in the Archean. There is growing evidence that the continents began to form in the Archean, and the continental crust of our planet first began to move around 3 billion years ago. Plate tectonics was born. Naturally, those things didn't happen all at once. The Earth was probably hotter throughout its body. This heat would have led to high heat flow, fast recycling of rocks, quick formation of oceanic crust, and rapid seafloor spreading. As a result, continents would have been much smaller than they are today and moved relatively fast across the Earth's surface. Sea level would have probably been higher than it is at any other point in Earth history. Fossils tell us that it was around this time that life first evolved on our planet. Life started out simple and small in the Archean and it did not get much bigger than bacteria until later in Earth history during the Proterozoic Eon. But it did evolve a wide array of biochemical pathways in the Archean, like photosynthesis, chemosynthesis, and respiration. These metabolic reactions would ultimately reshape the environments on our planet in astounding and fantastical ways. But let's save that story for another day.